Recording in progress. Okay, so I think. I think we'll go ahead and get started. All right. All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa Sage. And I'm happy to welcome you tonight to our Thursday night program. All right, excuse me. Uh, tonight, we're going to be celebrating uh, Maria Cusumano. We are able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you. While these programs are free, I encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your support is vital to the museum now more than ever. Uh, membership generates revenue needed to support exhibitions, educational programs, care of the collection, and more. The exhibition, Maria Cusumano, Mother Goddess Crone, is on view through June 18th in the Lewis Gallery. A dedicated poet, artist, and educator, Cusumano was fascinated with the nature of feminine power and how that power has been expressed throughout time and across cultures. Eleven prints recently gifted to the museum um, by Mark Towner are on display. Uh, they are part of her goddess graphic series and created in the 1990s while she was living and working in Iowa. Joining us this evening is Mark Towner, husband of the late artist and donor of the prints to the exhibition. He is Dean of the School of Visual and Performing Arts of Endicott College in Massachusetts. Previously, he held the appointments at the University of Iowa, at St. Ambrose University, St. Mary's College at Notre Dame, Ohio University, and Wayne State University, and positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the North Document Conservation Center, the American Craft Museum, and the Davenport Museum of Art, which is now the Figgy Art Museum. Uh, so welcome, Mark. Uh, through this program, we hope to celebrate Maria uh, her background, her artistic practice, and the prints in the exhibition. Uh, there will be a brief Q&A at the end of the program, so please feel free to type your questions into the chat and as we go along and as uh, we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, Mark, to start, I thought it would be great if we could discuss uh, her educational background. Uh, so she received her MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art and her BFA from Parsons School of Design. Uh, they're both known as being really excellent places to go and to learn about art and uh, take part in art making. So she would have been surrounded by a community of creatives um, during a really exciting time in the art world. And I was wondering if you could tell me about uh, the environment and the experience that she had there, maybe particularly uh, at Cranbrook, since that yeah. is where you also attended. Right, great. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, and it's uh, wonderful to be back in Davenport, um, virtually, if not in person. So uh, Maria and I met in 1980 when she attended Cranbrook Academy of Art uh, to earn her MFA in printmaking. I was already there, so I, I arrived in 79. We overlapped a year, and during that time, uh, we became best friends and uh, fell in love and ended up um, going a lot of places together. What, what was one, what's wonderful about Cranbrook, and it still is, is that it's a very small graduate art school in nine different departments, about 10 to 20 students in each department, and that's it. So one really gets to know their professors, their colleagues, and their um, students across campus. The students are from around the world, and uh, that makes for a wonderful, diverse mix of backgrounds. And Maria just totally drank that in um, 
as uh, she was uh, fascinated with, with people from around the world, uh, art from different cultures. Um, and as a side note, if you want to if you have any other questions about Cranbrook, I'll fill it in. But one of the things that Maria and I did together is that we were both on the soccer team. So believe it or not, uh, the art schools had soccer teams and we played schools like the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and, and, uh, and others from around the Midwest. So we had a lot of fun. This, uh, the piece on the screen is part of her senior, I mean, part of her MFA thesis. And uh, at this point, uh, although I would consider the work somewhat abstracted, almost non-representational in her own mind, these are figures um, the, the, um, of human figures or a metaphor for human figures and housing and uh, various social, political, and theological issues. They came up in rather abstract forms though, but for her, they were concrete issues. And was this typical of the kind of work that she was making during this period? Yes, I would say so. Now, uh, before she came to Cranbrook, she was at Parsons School of Design in New York City. And uh, her, she, she went in as a, as a fine art major and she transitioned to illustration, uh, still earning a BFA. So coming from New York, one of the art centers of the world, and coming from Parsons, huge emphasis on technical skills, such as color blending and figurative work. Uh, she found that Cranbrook was refreshing um, because there were fewer expectations about where she would go with her artwork. A a typical for a graduate program, uh, not to have one place in mind. All of our students need to do this, rather, the, the primary objective of a graduate fine art program is to find one's own voice. So she found it quite refreshing. And do I think- Do you think, do you think Parsons, uh, do you think Parsons gave her a good foundation and all of those technical- Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, so the stories, see, even though we were, she was no longer at Parsons. The stories were very fresh in her mind about different professors and different students and how the color theory was so exacting and how the requirements for figure drawing um, were, well, so exacting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, so expression and personal voice was less important in her undergraduate training. Rather, it was the skill and technique building. And I think it's a great combination. Uh, as an educator myself, I, I believe that at the baccalaureate level, for that first year or two, get the, get the technical skills down before trying to reinvent art. Mm. Now, she eventually uh, shifted her studies to psychology, to concentrate on psychology. Um, including completing a study on women and how they felt before and after childbirth. Uh, she did doctoral coursework at Antioch New England uh, Graduate School and at the University of Iowa. So uh, one thing that's apparent uh, when I was reading about her mm -hmm. is that she had interests across a vast array of disciplines. But even though there were all of these, you know, from religion to psychology, um, to uh, women's issues, to the metaphysical, they all kind of coalesce in her artwork. You can draw those interests out when you're looking at her work. And these large pastels that are, you know, life-size uh, from the mid-1980s, I think really reflect that. Um, can you describe how she navigated those varied interests in her life and then when she was creating works like these? Um, I'll give it a try. It's a, it's a, um, it's a big question. Yeah. yeah, it's a big question, but, but also Maria is a very complex woman and with very diverse interests. As you mentioned in the, in the opening, uh, she had a, a, a strong interest and background in Roman Catholicism. And uh, this always was the background for her. And that's why this religious and spiritual 
background um, followed her or kept her company, whether we whether she was in at Parsons, at Cranbrook, in Iowa City, back in New York City again, here to the East Coast. It was um, her interest in theology followed her around. There was the the fact that her interest in different specific religions uh, grew and shifted, I think allowed her to, to navigate and, and uh, experiment in different circumstances. For example, um, when one gets into Hinduism, um, there are specific texts about the psychology um, a Hinduistic perspective on psychology, very different, although overlapping, with Western psychology. So going for, in, in Buddhism with, um, with some of its major tenets allowed her to navigate these areas that for people that were more um, strict with their own practice might not be able to get into. I think that helped her um, move from one culture, one city, one art medium to another. It was this background. Uh, she, so this particular uh, work was um, on view in New York City uh, when she had a solo show in the burgeoning uh, East Village art scene. And as you said, Vanessa, these are virtually life-size and they're in pastel. And although at graduate school, she was doing more abstract non-representational, she decided to explore some of the themes a little more overtly, themes of um, enlightenment, themes of childbearing, themes of uh, re religious and psychological themes. And to better illustrate those themes, she went with the more illustrative representative uh, approach. Hence, you've got the figure here. And this previous slide, I believe it was, the figures were just little uh, people dancing around um, a land landscapes on that panel. So in addition to, to studying these different disciplines uh, and these navigating these interests, she was also an educator. And one of the places where she uh, she taught at Endicott College from 2001 to 2018, but then also locally uh, in Davenport, she gave lectures at the Davenport Museum and also taught at St. Ambrose. Uh, can you speak a little bit to how uh, how she felt being an educator figured into her practice or just her life more broadly? Well, sure. Maria loved to read. And, uh, and she loved to share and she loved to talk and she loved to write. Uh, her, her influence on our son led to him um, being a, a, a scholar and uh, pursuing his and obtaining his uh, multiple degrees, including a PhD from MIT. I attribute this to Maria's inquisitive mind or at least in part, and maybe my discipline, you know, the background and education I have. So discipline and, and, and inquisitiveness. So coming to Iowa City, um, leaving New York, um, she felt very welcome. And in a way it's very refreshing because teaching at St. Ambrose, uh, doing some of the education programs at what, is now the Fig Art Museum. Um, she found it was very welcoming. And no matter what, and I can attest to this because just yesterday I was going through her archives, she was extremely well prepared. Mm -hmm. So I have a CD, I have a stack of 200 CDs, one for every lecture that she gave for figure drawing. Like that is outstanding. Um, her notes, uh, I, I have all of her notes and her lecture notes for what she presented at the Davenport Museum of Art on Frida Kahlo, something that you had, um, at least in our own discussions between you and I, had referenced. 
So I think Maria was, her inquisitiveness uh, inspired her to read and to write and be a very thorough educator. And hence, fairly easy, no, it's not easy for anyone, but um, not a difficult transition from being in a, in a community arts center to a major museum, to a small university, to a major university. Um, it does take some confidence, but her, her level of preparedness was really uniform. So I don't know if Vanessa, if that kind of addresses it uh, or maybe too much, but um, preparedness, her backgrounds allowed for fluidity. Mm -hmm. But then she also must have had a desire to uh, share that knowledge with others in a really complete and comprehensive way, it sounds like. I would say yes. And so um, wanting to lecture, but not necessarily be a full-time per person. Um, hence, she worked uh, part-time at many different places. And uh, liking to have an audience, I, it wasn't solely so that she could know that she could grandstand. Uh, she mm. loved the interaction and the dialogue. I remember at, at the Davenport Museum of Art when the Gorilla Girls were the, the guest artists and they came in from New York. The, we, she interacted with them in, in fantastic ways and with the audiences. So interactivity of, of being a presenter or a professor or an educator or even a curator like yourself in this circumstance. Um, yeah. Let's move on to this next slide. So this work here, was this work what you were referring to previously? Um, I have referred to this piece, both with you and um, now I wasn't referring directly uh, a few minutes ago to this piece, but um, this is one of her uh, very large pastels. So earlier you had shown the, the portrait of Maria standing with the life size. She made these others, which are also formidable in size. Yeah, you had referenced that one. Mm -hmm. Now this yeah. one is about half as big, but it's nevertheless, what is that? 30 by 40 inches. Oh, it's 20. Yeah, these are, yeah, these are very large very large pastels. I mean, this is uh, to be working um, with pastel on this medium, on this scale, something that you really see. Um, so, yeah. And one of the things I really like is the composition is so strong and it comes through, but then there's also a lot of fluid mark making going on with the individual strokes. Um, what drew her to use pastel and to get so deep into pastel during this period of time? Well, that's interesting. Um, pastel is a drawing medium in contrast to, let's say, oil or watercolor being a painting medium. And so I think a couple of things. One is she, she, she was drawing on um, actually drawing on her drawing skills and wanting to have some degree of representation with the figurative elements here. So a drawing medium can be a faster application than let's say an oil painting that might take weeks or months to build up something like this. So the draw, the quickness, the immediacy of drawing, the illustrative characters, but I also, uh, the huge factor is the luminosity the pointillism, the approach that she did with these. And so, um, and it allowed for expressiveness too. Like we frequently teach our beginning art students to draw at an easel where they're standing, body motion, uh, large sweeps. Now in this case, Maria would stand um, but she could stand and, and hash mark and really interact with it. It's a different process. Uh, but the illuminosity of this pointillistic approach is what Maria loved about uh, the pastel medium. It, it retained its luminosity. And I think that really comes across in these two as well. There's um, on the, these two works both have 
these really like sparks of, of light and color. Um, and they also seem to reference uh, creation uh, with the egg forms and, um, you know, they're almost these like womb-like forms on the one on the, the right. Mm -hmm. um, so when he was creating these works, uh, you talked about how she was standing when she was making the marks, but how, what was her process like? Did she start with a sketch and then move from there? I know she also used photographs uh, as well. So how did, how yes. was her process? How did that unravel for these? Uh, yes, uh, Maria did use photographs. Now these uh, these pastel on paper pieces were um, from the mid '80s, and and later when she was in Iowa, she was working in letterpress, and we'll probably get to that. But you mentioned photography, so she did use photography more and more often as the figure was introduced. Now in the right hand. Uh, what's on my screen as the right hand, um, the only human figure is the woman that's sort of slumping. Mm -hmm. And that was not done by replicating a photograph. However, on the left hand where there's a woman, well, I know it's a woman, um, with scissors in hand, cutting the head off of a snake. While a phoenix kind of bird is rising with the egg that you had mentioned. Now that figure there, I know it's a woman because that's Maria. We made a photograph as we did many times of her for her to create her artworks from. And that is her hair, um, the haircut, that is an outline of her body and her head. So she did use photography when it came down to creating these these larger pastels. And frequently it was herself that was the model, or if it was a male, it could have been me, or we hired um, artist friends or retained them to model. And I would usually be the, I was not usually, I was always the photographer and would create prints for her or projections as she needed them. On the other hand, she did have that background in figure drawing. So like that slumping figure in the right hand, I and mean, that's just a free form concept of hers. Right. Now this is Maria at Women's Fest. Now, this was a is this a this was a feminist women's festival, right? That was yes. this in, in Michigan or was this this, this one might have been in Michigan. Uh, uh, there, I know there was uh, Maria attended some women's festivals in Michigan, Indiana, California, and I'm not sure if there was one in Iowa. But um, she was uh, at several different uh, women's fests. Some of them were music fests, some of them were art fests, um, and um, there was a transpersonal psychology fest in a festival or conference in California. So this one. Um, Maybe you, your records show whether it was Indiana or um, Michigan or Illinois, but it was one of the Midwest states. Um, so she was really active around the Midwest. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, Goddess Graphics came about when she was living and working in Iowa. Is that right? Yeah, so that, absolutely right. Um, so Goddess Graphics, wow. Generally speaking, the dates might be about 1992 to 1998, although some of the seeds for it were earlier and some of the remnants continued after that. But those were the really the years where she was actively running a company called Goddess Graphics. Uh, she did all of the printing herself on letterpress. Um, on occasionally, she would do linoleums, large linoleums and woods but goddess graphics, and then she would market it and in a variety of ways from gallery showings, museum showings, but mostly at people's festivals of sorts. And uh, so this is a picture of Maria showing her wares and um, 
you can see the her signage up above and in the background uh, on the table are some of her prints and then hanging there are some of her t-shirts. So, oh, by the way, I think the gift shop at your museum now has some prints and some t-shirts to sell. We certainly do. And we've already, uh, they're already being very well received. So hopefully we see some goddess graphics t-shirts out on the streets of Davenport this summer. I think we will. Great. <laughs> So uh, just to, so goddess graphics, uh, these are, yeah, those are two examples of her goddess graphics that um, I think it's important to see this picture of Maria. She was happy in this environment. Uh, at these women's fests, um, people loved to see and embrace the goddess imagery, the, the feminism, um, um, honoring women um, in, their, in their intelligence and in their beauty. Uh, so Maria, that I mean, this typical big smile on her face kind of a portrait. Now, um, when you were in Davenport during the same time period, um, can you talk a little bit about more about your interactions with the community, creative community here? I know you said you felt it was very welcoming here, um, but maybe specifically your experiences in Davenport, and sure. I know you were you were of course also involved with the Davenport Museum of Art. Um, so maybe how how that was a a good environment to be in. So we had uh, come. Um, let's see, we moved to Iowa, and I think it was 1988, and uh, from living in Brooklyn, New York, and working in Manhattan. At, I worked at a gallery. Maria worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so we were in a vibrant art community in New York. We left New York. I'm getting to your question. We <laughs> left New York um, to have a family. And Maria wanted to leave New York City to do that. And so I honored that, of course. And um, we opted on a university town. So we went to University of Iowa in Iowa City. Um, I had family there. What we found in Iowa City and the Quad Cities was an extremely welcome, welcoming community. Uh, we pretty quickly made friends in the museum world, in the art world, in the in the women's uh, women's circles of Iowa City, and um, and it was at a different. It was more one to one in small group, without the the heady environment of working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art or something like that, where people were really sweet. But it was when you leave when you leave the Met to go home. You, you know, you're leaving everything and you're entering a new world. When we would leave St. Ambrose or Davenport Museum of Art, uh, we would socialize with the people, the people, uh, our friends, our colleagues um, over the weekends. And, and it was, so it was really warm. Um, uh, she and I both made uh, what, uh, really good friends. Um, you know, some of the faculty, Les Bell and um, at, at, at that institute and Lloyd Shoneman at Quad City Arts and people at Arts Iowa City, at the University of Iowa. And so I guess to summarize it, very welcoming. Real people um, fascinated by art and culture. And I think we have a couple of uh, people who were around during that time that are zooming in tonight. We've got Bug here as Bug. well as, yep, mm -hmm. Linda and Randy Lewis. Um, there's also Sylvia Sorensen, so. Wow, that, hey, you all, great. So glad you're here. And um, <laughs> when I learned that Maria's work was being exhibited in, in the Lewis Gallery, it's like, Randy and Linda, isn't it? Um, I remember them and, uh, and when I made the uh, when I offered the the artworks to the museum, um, of all not of all people, but it was great to get a note from Budge, um, you know, a handwritten note. It was like 
This is what Maria and I encountered when we left New York City and came to the Quad Cities in Iowa City. And it's still there. I, um, it's wonderful. Um, so I thought now we could talk about the specific works that you donated. And I okay. can tell you that the response in the museum has been very positive. People are drawn. The, very, the Lewis Gallery is a wonderfully intimate space. Um, and so when you go in there, you can really be one-on-one -on -one with these works. Um, and there's so much detail and uh, so much strength to them uh, that it's, it's a wonderful exhibition. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage everybody to see it. It's on view through June 18th. Um, so we'll go ahead and go through some of the individual prints now. So one of the overarching themes in our work, um, but specifically in this exhibition is the power of the feminine. Uh, the feminine body, the feminine spirit, um, what the female, um, you know, what we are capable of as women as projected by these goddess figures. Um, and birth is one of the recurring motifs. Um, and this is an example. We have uh, both uh, the black and white as well as the hand colored version of this print. And it's this primordial deity who seems to be giving birth um, to the world, so drawing on all of these different creation myths from different cultures. Um, now, even though this is uh, references different cultures and she read about all of these, all of this work was filtered through her personal artistic viewpoint and her personal experiences. Um, so what do you think spurred her or connected her um, to this concept of, of the goddess and of goddesses and of exploring that in her work? Right. Okay, so the background in theology and religion. So one could say, okay, so she has, she had an interest in gods and goddesses. It started out as God and the um, within the uh, Christian background. And as she explored Hinduism, it became gods and goddesses. Of course, even before that, through art history and the history of humankind, uh, we understand uh, from uh, ancient Greeks and Romans, the importance of these goddess and god figures. So that's the background. I think the huge turning point for Maria in terms of an interest in, in, um, in, the, in this particular piece as it was in the beginning uh, was an inspiration inspired by the birth of her own son, Marco. And ultimately Marco was um, our combined greatest creation. So Maria's having had a, a child, gone through the pregnancy process and the birthing process, um, led her to have a new interest in a different form of femininity, of, uh, of women's studies that had to do with multi-generational and child rearing. This comes up obviously in this piece, but it also came up in the in the psychology coursework that she was doing in the research that she was doing at the University of Iowa, where she um, co-authored with one of the professors, um, a, a very well-known, uh, world-renowned psychologist, um, Robert Barron, um, a paper that was published, The Effect of Desired Control and Anticipated Control on the Stress of Childbirth. So even in psychology, she was focusing in on this. In her art, she was, in her psychology. I don't know if I'm getting to the answer of that question, but I wanted to address this particular piece and her other interest in, in graduate work in psychology. Well, it's certainly all linked together, you know. I would say, but I, uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, Vanessa, but I wanted to get back to, I think, part of the impetus of the question. So what um, spurred her interest in women's studies or uh, feminist and goddesses? Uh, and I think that goes back to some of her experience as a young woman, young woman in, even at Parsons and certainly at Cranbrook when I was interacting with her, 
some of the misogynistic uh, uh, situations that she was placed in as um, an outgoing, attractive young woman who um, loved figurative artwork, uh, I think that she took some heat from some of the old timers, you know? I don't know how else to put it. Uh, and so it was an exploring of a kind of a reaction. It's like, wait a minute, it's not only in my own life, but it's systemic, it's cultural, it's multicultural. Um, and we need to celebrate um, our bodies. Um, we need to celebrate birthing and the, the, the hierarchy of women. It's a celebration mm -hmm. of her own femininity. Of her. So in a way, one could go, then go back into maybe a Jungian perspective on self-analysis, which Maria was very interested in. And so really investigating her own, well, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to um, be empowered by the childbirth experience? Mm -hmm. That kind of brings us to this next work, uh, mm -hmm. which is Blood Red Poppy Spills Her Seed. So for me, this one, I mean, it, it references menstruation, which is also something that um, is not, it's still taboo. And, uh, you know, in certain countries, it like parts of Africa and Nepal, um, there's, there's a lot of a shame uh, associated with it. Um, but she's celebrating it here. Um, and it's have, you can see the whole, the whole thing is kind of a celebration of that cycle. And mm -hmm. here, it's, you know, mirroring the cycle of cell creation and of life creation. So it's kind of marrying this, you know, the biological with the spiritual. Um, so you talked about her experiences as a woman, as a female artist. Um, how did she, with Goddess Graphics, one of the goals was dissemination, right? It, I was reading the, the catalog that you so kindly sent and she wanted these images to be accessible. Um, so people could purchase them and take them home. And why was that so important to Maria? Um, and how did the letterpress medium make that more attainable? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm glad you picked up on uh, how the letterpress why the letterpress is such a valuable medium for someone to disseminate imagery. So it, it really can go back to the history of the printing press um, where um, religious uh, texts could be um, produced um, and not, not having to, could be reproduced. So in this case, Maria felt that her figurative work, that her drawing skills and her background in printmaking would be quality reproductions or productions, because in her case, they were the end product uh, of her of her ideas. The letterpress, different than, let's say, a woodblock print or a linoleum, the letterpress allows her to take her drawing and to uh, transfer it onto a plate. And that plate could be run through the printing press boom, 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 as opposed to one every 10 minutes with mm -hmm. re-inking. Um, the letterpress designed for uh, literary text, um, she was able to, as other artists have, adapt it to, um, to visual work. So the letterpress allowed her to create quantity. Still, she was the one printing them in their total control. Uh, many thanks to Al Buck and others at the Center for the Book Arts uh, in Iowa City. Um, she, she was able to do that and she wanted to make them available to interested people at a fraction of the cost of what it might, what, what you or I might or another artist might charge for an engraving that we made 10 copies or even 20 would be a lot. Whereas she could make a hundred copies of this particular. Now, in this case, um, I can see that this is number 10 of, what is that, 25? Mm -hmm. So she didn't go overboard with the signed larger prints. 
but with the note cards and the smallers, she, she really printed out a lot and she wanted to make them available to the general public. And I think that's the long answer to your question. It's a great medium for that. Um, and I'm gonna come back to something that's like not only the letterpress, but also why goddess graphics. So um, I'm gonna read something that she wrote in one of her catalogs. I created goddess graphics to fill the visual mind womb of women. I hope they inspire and bring together alike thinkers and feelers. I also wish to bring a broader awareness to others so that their mind wombs get full with mother love for all. So it's to bring this message and that's what the printed press does or did, did for her. And then these are two more works in the exhibition. One thing um, is also that she did a lot of color variations and also hand colored versions of the works um, and all different sizes, the different sizes as well. Um, I think these are among the strongest um, images in the exhibition and it's the goddess of Babylon known as Ishtar or Inanna. And here you can see there's symbols of, of harvest and she's also watching over the flock. Um, when Maria was creating images like this, was she looking at any particular artists or artworks? Well, that's uh, interesting. Um, Maria and I, um, both of us have a background in working in museums and going to museums all the time. But I think that what was more inspiring were some of the authors and some of the books rather than the artists. So in these cases, um, there were several different authors, <coughs> excuse me, that Maria was fascinated with. Uh, many of them had a Jungian or a post-Jungian approach to um, psychology. And that also interested Maria immensely. Uh, one of the books, uh, I actually have it here, it's called The Way of All Women. And it's by M. Esther Harding, who did uh, have a, uh, an inter uh, interchange with um, Carl Jung. So that the, the way of all, it's, it's an expose of modern women and the very various roles that she played. Um, another book that uh, I, I, I kept Maria's books. Um, another book that um, she was... Uh, really influenced by is called Goddess in Every Women, in Every Woman, singular, sorry. Goddesses in Every Woman, a new psychology of women. <clears throat> With a foreword by um, Gloria Steinem. So uh, there were many of these books. Those were two of her favorites. I made a note uh, elsewhere of another one, The Dictionary of Women in Religious Art. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we were talking earlier about the large pastels, uh, you mentioned she often used herself as a as a figure model. Um, now for these, did she do any of that for her print work, or was yeah. that more the pastels? And then. Do you think there's anything more than it was just convenience or you know the accessibility of being your own um, model and being able to experiment and being poses? Um, for me, it almost seems like uh, there's this connectivity, a spiritual connectivity that she was linking into or tapping into. Um, do you think that was part of it at all? I think that's a fair um, observation. Uh, I think um, your preface by saying, well, there is the convenience, your, your partner is a professional photographer and mm -hmm. you are a model. So um, in this case, she was a model. But I do think there's a sense of empowerment um, and exploration that, uh, and projection of herself into some of these images. The one on the left uh, in this uh, case actually was uh, a model was one of um, a young artist at the University of 
uh, in Iowa City, I don't think she was a student, um, who modeled. Um, some of the other works that you've shown, Maria was the model. And part of that was convenience. Part of that was empowerment and exploring. I, I Now here I'm, I'm making assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, part of it would be her exploring uh, her identity in these different roles. And this is Kuan Yin, who's the, the Buddhist uh, goddess of mercy and compassion. And Buddhism played a big role in her life. When did she first become interested in Buddhism? I think she told me that she was first interested in Buddhism when she was in high school. And she was still practicing um, um, devout Catholic. Um, the thing about um, Buddhism in, in, I guess in many interpretations is that it's not contradictory. It's, um, so it doesn't necessarily contradict uh, um, an orthodox strict concept of, of uh, Catholicism. Um, it's a philosophy more than a religion. Mm -hmm. I think that's, at least that's how Maria saw it. So uh, she was introduced to it um, pretty fairly early in um, suburban Michigan uh, high school. Uh, she was also introduced to art history and, uh, and the visual arts in high school. So I think that's one of the, the aspects of privilege of going to um, high schools that um, offer up different different disciplines, such as art history, such as art, such as uh, religious courses. I don't think it necessarily came directly out of her family. Um, Maria was by far the most far-reaching and open-minded of, of her siblings. So the Buddhism goes way back. The Hinduism was introduced much later um, into her life. Um, as a result of some of these explorations, uh, let's say here with this bodhisattva, um, as she was exploring different aspects of religiosity, of figures in art history, of feminine figures and goddesses, um, I think that got her into Hinduism in a huge way. And she ended up practicing a, 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 a practice that's called Vedanta. Mm -hmm. And um, Vedanta is, a, is a based on the word Vedas. And Vedas are the spiritual scriptures. They're not limited to Hindu. The Buddhist, the Christian, the Judaic, the Islamic um, scriptures, uh, sacred texts are all a part of Vedanta. And so that's why Maria got, I, I think some of these images, like what you've put on the right here, um, some of the images inspired her to explore the religions more. Um, now, symbolism is also a really big part of the work. You can see it in this work with there's these bees and they're making a honeycomb and the lily pads and um, this baby and down here below. And then here we have uh, the maiden mother crone, which is, you know, one of the most well-known, um, however you want to call it, symbolism of the life stages of, of women, but it also uh, reflects on all sorts of different aspects of life, of experience, of growth. Right. Um, and this work, there's a lot of symbolism going on in this work. You see there's there, there's offerings, there's abundance at the, the base of this tree. Um, what are the, some of the things that you notice about this work? Can you give offer us any insight into maybe what she was thinking or sure. what some of these symbolism meant to her? Yeah, sure, I can give it a try. Uh, we did talk about it. And, um, and um, so I'll integrate a previous commentary about into this one. Um, that uh, the woman in, um, in the right uh, who's facing us, um, uh, that's Maria. So Maria posed for that. Um, the woman in the center, the pregnant woman with the dark hair, she um, was a model. And, um, and the woman on the left who represents the crone uh, was in from her imagination. And the tree 
is a is a giving birth to the child. You can see all the the women. Well, we don't know they're women. I do because she told me uh, all the women that are approaching this kind of festival atmosphere. And I think that some of the music fests and some of the women's fests that she attended influenced this particular piece. Now, this is my conjecture. Um, I don't have it documented, but it was created in a time when she was already participating in some of the festivals. And she found it to be so refreshing, um, the fact that at some of the women's festivals, um, the women could be naked or topless, um, that they could be, you know, that they could um, metaphorically embrace each other uh, without the, without being threatened by the presence of men. So I, th I think this particular one is a, is a kind of a woman's festival of some sort, celebrating birth and the three state, three of the many stages of womanhood. And I also noticed that in the, in the background, there's these storm clouds with water uh, and rain pouring down. And then you can see that there's, there's a forest as well. So it's almost like this is just one part of this world and it extends far beyond and there's water and there's more trees and there's more life, right. you know, beyond this. Uh, yeah. this You've got the, um, and then in the, the, the woman in the background um, on the left to the left of the tree, she's drumming. She's got, mm -hmm. a, so that's part of the, the, the music fest that I was referencing. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And then this next work, um, this is a, you know, an art historical ethnographic re reference. So uh, the Venus of Willendorf, uh, which is from 24,000 to 22,000 BCE, it's very famous. It's about four inches tall, thought to re represent a uh, fertility figure or fertility goddess, perhaps. And in these, this work by Maria, this uh, figure is balancing on top of the world. And there's all this cosmic activity happening around the figure. You have turtles and eggs, once again, uh, symbols of uh, creation of plenty of abundance and the water looks like water rippling where there's water there's life um, and one thing that this figure represents for a lot of people is the celebration of um, body positivity of beauty of female beauty in all of its forms in this case of the full figured form mm -hmm. um, was that part of the reason that she decided to use this figure in such a powerful way? Yes, is the short answer. But um, I, to elaborate a little bit, um, to embrace um, the, the figure in all of its forms was something that um, Maria wanted to do in, in her artwork. And the, but the Venus is one of the most powerful and what dating back, I'm, I'm guessing, what did you say, but maybe dating back 30,000 years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so this particular piece, I think it's another representation of, of how she wanted to promote um, a positive um, woman's identity. Uh, she also sees this as a celebratory piece, like you've pointed out, the eggs and the fish and the turtles, all these wonderful things in this cosmic world. Uh, one of the things that um, she said uh, about this piece, she, the, the goddess, stands enlightened by the all-seeing eyes of her distant ancestors, the mm -hmm. sun and the moon. From the outer circle, darts present destructive forces, which persistently threaten our wholeness chipping away at our planet's peace. So would I have known that? I mean, I, we do get the sense of, of a bombardment, mm -hmm. but amongst it all is, is the powerful figure standing on the earth uh, with the sun and the moon in a sense represented. 
Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, what uh, it, it, I think it makes sense that if she's going to really address that she select the, some of these topics in the goddess figures that she's got to give homage to the to the to the oldest and mm -hmm. the most powerful and probably the most renowned goddess figures in the history of humanity. Now, in addition to all of her other interests, uh, she was also a poet and wrote uh, poetry. Um, and we included some of her work in the exhibition alongside um, the prince. And this one is where the title of the exhibition comes from. Um, Smell the sweet perfume to know my mother goddess grown. And if you read this poem, it really, it's personal, but then it also extends to the more, um, this more universal concept of spiritual, spirituality. So for, again, from the personal expanding outward. Um, and during the uh, 2000s, she shifted uh, from making visual art more towards music and poetry and spirituality. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, that shift uh, during that time period? I think I can. Uh, so part of it happened uh, with the geographical move from, uh, from Iowa to Massachusetts. And I think that um, she, she was the one that uh, precipitated uh, the, that move. She, you know, she was, Maria kept pushing me along and, um, and I'm grateful for that. So when we came uh, to Massachusetts, I think she saw it as a breaking point, <clears throat> an opportunity for change. She also at that time became more and more interested in some of the ancient scriptures. And so went from the visual world into the literary world and into the to religious history and sacred texts. And that's when, so when she came out here to Massachusetts, she got uh, involved in the Vedanta Society. And um, it was, she was inspired by, I would say religious experiences, not necessarily mind altering, hallucination shattering, but no, nevertheless, religious experiences within certain communities, but also in her own meditation practice. And she less and less frequently picked up art supplies to create a work of art and more and more frequently uh, wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. And then as she was writing poetry and exploring this, she decided to put some of the poets poetry that she wrote to music. And that inspired her then to actually take some of the sacred texts and create the, the score for them and then sing them. So she could be uh, singing uh, Sw Swami uh, Yogatmananda's um, uh, prayer, um, but Maria created the score and then um, actually sang it in some of the temples and some of the um, ashrams, um, and, but also in the parks of, of Manhattan in Central Park and in the Boston Commons. Um, she just was taking it out there into the world. So the, the, the ship from being uh, primarily visual with some literary text uh, to being primarily music and poetry, uh, that came when we moved. And we moved here, uh, let's see, um, 1998. Mm. And that became a big shift. But I will say that um, like this, this, the poem that you have here, um, that for, for most every piece that she created during Goddess Graphics, she wrote some sort of poetic piece. Now, that, that was only a few dozen, but it wasn't, so it wasn't a huge quantity of poetry, but it was um, inspired and cohabitated with the visual. Now we'll move on to uh, the last work in the show. And this one is a bit, uh, it's different than the others. I would say 
the other um, images in the exhibition are very much um, empowering uh, images of women, but this one is more of a, a vulnerable image and it's called a uh, boogeyman. And, and um, this shows another side to the female experience, um, perhaps to do with um, power systems or abuse. Um, um, the restriction of female autonomy as the central figure is being um, bound by these dark shadowy figures um, behind her. Um, so in addition to these images of celebration and empowerment, um, this addresses kind of the other side of that experience. Was this one of the only works that she made in this manner or, or were there other works um, like this? Uh, most of her works were on more of the positive side. She did explore some of the um, other sides of the human psyche, such as this one. Uh, we could uh, address this one uh, from a Jungian perspective, and Maria was exploring her shadow, uh, mm. the, the shadow side of what may be within her. So the one... I'm going to come back to there are other works that are less than positive. But with this particular piece, uh, one can think of it in two ways. Is this woman being um, absconded with, uh, taken advantage of, killed? Um, these are two death mask kind of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and does that reflect something like a, a window? We would look out and see that, oh my gosh, there's this terrible scene happening. Or is it a mirror? And, mm. and that reflecting uh, a part of herself that maybe a, the, the woman's side of herself was felt like it was absconded with, was killed. Mm -hmm. So um, there is no right or wrong answer to this for her or for anyone, but I think that her Jungian approach to image making sometimes um, is reflected here. She did make other pieces that were less than positive that also were investigating her own psyche in her own being. And one was called um, Good Mother, Bad Mother. And it had the picture, it, it, um, it, uh, it, it has two women in the same picture, each holding their infant. And one is the infant is being coddled and caressed. And the other one, the mother is going to devour. Oh. So, um, and Maria, I mean, those are themes. Um, that run throughout history and mythology. There are also themes that some people might have of like, was I a good mother or was I a bad mm -hmm. mother? Mm -hmm. Again, there's no right or wrong or definitive answer, but it's an exploration. I would say that for every positive, no, for every negative kind of, let's not call them negative, I'll call them, yes. um, you know, darker, whatever um, piece, there were probably five or 10 of the more positive ones, the more life affirming. But she mm -hmm. was, not, it was not, um, yeah, she wasn't closed down to exploring. She didn't shy away from those aspects of yeah. life. Thank yes. You. Mm -hmm. So I have to say that um, we're all really thrilled to have these works at the Figgy Art Museum. Like I said before, they have been very well received by people in the community. And um, it's wonderful that they were uh, created here and we can reacquaint people with them at the museum. Um, and at this point, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions uh, from the audience. If you wanna type them into the Q&A or the chat, if you have any questions that you would like to ask Mark. Um, we do have some comments, one from Budge. Uh, he says, fond memories, um, only about her smile, which you did mention earlier. Um, and then he asked if you know the, the low bells. I'm not sure. So, Budge, I see that question in the chat, and um, I'm not, I, I probably do, but this is many years for me, and um, I'm not sure if my memory is failing me or not. Anyway, um, maybe if someone were to remind me, um, um, maybe I do, maybe I don't. It doesn't ring a bell. And then we have a comment from Linda uh, Lewis. 
Uh, thank you, Mark, for these wonderful works by Maria. They are exceptional prints with consuming subject matter. These topics are so current now and will be received by both uh, men and women in the Quad Cities. Um, they remember you both very well. Um, yeah. And you must come back to the piggy. <laughs> Um, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's my parents um, met in Iowa City um, back before World War II. And so um, I have roots there. And I lived there for 12 years in Iowa. And I would love to come back. <laughs> well, whenever you have the time, we'd love to have you. Okay. And see the, the figgy. Um, so I think if there aren't any questions, we'll go ahead and conclude the program. Um, Mark, I have to say it was a pleasure. And uh, I know we all loved hearing your insights about Maria and her work. Um, and we'll be pleased to share this uh, with more people and we'll post this online. Uh, Vanessa, and um, it's been great. You, you really are insightful. Uh, you've done not only your homework, but you've, you know, you, you, I can see your mind has been working, and I really appreciate that. And I, I'm really glad that Budge and Randy and uh, Linda and um, people showed up. Um, it's really cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, and you have a wonderful evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night.